Namaste and Jai Hind, ladies and gentlemen. It's yet another edition of The Right Perspective. And in this edition, we are sitting with somebody who's passionate about Bharat. At every level, right through his serving career, he has always thought about a better Bharat, a better India. And now, he's also written a book, his latest effort, it's called Made in India. So I am sitting in front of none other than the Sherpa of India at G20, that is Amitabh Kanji. Amitabh Ji, Namaste and thank you very Namaste. much. It's a pleasure. And uh, I'm getting to sit uh, face to face with you, but for a good reason. So let's start with the genesis of this book. And also, you've tried to chronicle the story of business in independent India over the last 75 years. How do you see it growing or changing? Uh, so, Anand, uh, first of all, thanks uh, for having me here. And uh, this is uh, really uh, uh, trying to chronicle 75 years of India's business and enterprise. It's important because uh, before the British came in, we had about 25% per percent of the global uh, GDP. By the time they left, it dwindled down to just about 5%. Uh, it's getting accelerated now and it's important to grow at rapid pace. And I've been a long-term believer that it's uh, very, very important that, that the private sector creates wealth in India and the government remains a catalyst. And this would require uh, what we've tried to do in the last uh, seven, eight years. The prime ministers try tried to make things easy and simple. Uh, we've brought in major structural reforms across uh, uh, GST, IBC, RERA, uh, lower levels of corporate tax, and uh, we've tried to digitize our economy, and now it's time to really accelerate and uh, increase uh, our GDP in a very big way. And there are huge lessons to be learned from many other countries of the world on how they accelerated the pace, because we need to become productively a very efficient economy, but it's very important for Indian businesses to be globally competitive, they must be able to penetrate global markets. Mm -hmm. And without India's exports growing and without our penetrating global markets, it will be very difficult to sustain growth over the next three decade period. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying this because uh, there is a difference between growing at 6%, there's a difference between growing at 8%, and there's a difference growing at 10%. The compounding power of growth is so enormous, so enormous, that uh, if you grow at 6%, uh, uh, you will take your per capita income to about, by 2047, to about 16,000. If you grow at 8%, you will take it to 22,000. But if you grow at 10%, uh, you will take it close to 30,000 per capita income. You would have lifted everybody above the poverty line. And other countries have done this in Southeast Asia. So it's really our time. It's once in a lifetime opportunity to do this, to become a great uh, productive nation, a very efficient nation, and for businesses to become globally uh, competitive. You said something which is very critical, and I totally endorse your view there, and I must be candid, where you said that it's not the government's job to run businesses. It's the private sector to create wealth, create jobs, create a system, the economics has to be done. Governance is the government's job. But the moment the private sector is encouraged, or you're creating an environment where you say, oh, we want the private in, you know, sector to come in and flourish, the allegation of crony capitalism comes into play. The, the political dynamics comes into play. How much is that a deterrent? There are two questions, two parts to this question. This is the first part. Well, uh, to my mind, it's the policy framework which is important. It's not the individuals which matter. If you lay down a policy framework where you make things easy and simple, like we try to do, you need to scrap a lot of rules and regulation, which this country has done. It's scrapped about 1,500 laws. Mm. Uh, it's uh, uh, done away with a lot of paperwork. It's ensured that people interact with government digitally. And uh, I think we just need to sustain that over a long period of time. Uh, we need to make, uh, we brought our corporate tax to low levels. We've uh, brought in goods and services tax, subsuming over almost about uh, 30 or taxes. And therefore, uh, all these areas, we've used the COVID period to bring in major structural reforms. And uh, therefore, it's not about individual businesses. We've created a climate where private sector must grow and prosper. And uh, as we now move 
uh, from. Uh, it's very important to do this because I think all countries have grown on the back of good urbanization. Yes. India must urbanize uh, and this must be a manufacturing-led urbanization with, uh, you know, uh, and very different kind of urbanization and that's what I've talked about, that the urban form is very important. I've also said that our growth has to be very distinct from the kind of growth Europe and America have had because uh, when they were industrializing, they were carbonizing the world. They've uh, take consumed over 88% of the total carbon space which is available. But when India grows, it must become the first country in the world to industrialize without carbonizing the world. And therefore, India's growth will have to be driven by both going digital and going green in a very big way. And it, I think the real, real big opportunity for India is to use its climatic condition to be able to do renewables, to be able to do green hydrogen at the lowest cost and become a champion of uh, the lowest cost producer of green hydrogen to the world mm -hmm. and uh, actually the biggest exporter to the world and uh, make itself uh, uh, a country with clean, clean renewables and clean hydrogen. Well, I was just speaking with R.K. Singh Ji and he was saying his target is to generate 125 gigawatts of renewable energy to power the requirement of green uh, hydrogen. hydrogen. Yeah, yeah. So, and he says he wants to do that by 2030 while meeting the 500 gigawatt target of renewable energy for, yeah, the, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, as far consumption. So, he was talking about that. But are the, is the private sector biting? Why is it that even eight years later, one gets the sense that the animal instinct is not yet out in the private sector? They are not buying this story, have they embraced it now? Uh, so, Anand, uh, two things. One is, my belief is uh, that uh, that moment is, uh, we are just a little away from that when you'll see a lot of private sector investment coming in. Mm. Uh, I have no doubt that it will come in in a big way. And secondly, uh, because we are the fastest growing large economy in the world, we'll go on to become the third largest. We need to accelerate the pace. Mm. Uh, the second is that the global scenario, uh, because eventually you grow when you're able to export also, yeah. the global scenario has uh, got impacted a little bit. But I, my view is that several schemes that we have done, including the production-linked incentive PLIs. scheme, uh, and PLIs are really about uh, uh, bringing in size and scale to manufacturing. It's a scheme uh, which is uh, for a limited period. We've said that you have to become export competitive. You have to uh, get the big size and scale. So only those who are very, very competitive will be able to achieve it. And therefore, uh, there's a huge incentive for the private sector to push for size and scale and then go global in all these areas. And we are seeing results of that coming in. in uh, you've seen Apple, you've seen Samsung uh, moving in here. You'll see this in specialty steel. You'll see this in battery storage. You'll see this in electric mobility. Uh, you will see this in a lot of sunrise areas of growth which are going to give you value in the days to come. And I think uh, the important lesson is that whatever we do today has to be to that size and scale. Hmm. More than 200 meetings of the G20 leadership this year across 56 cities. It's the largest ever. But is it productive? Are nations willing to come here, engage with India and also it's, it's predominantly trade and by default then comes into economics. So to to push this entire aspect of make in India and to also consume what is made in India, is it happening? Oh, lots. Uh, so every meeting has seen actually record participation. Uh, our model of G20 uh, is being very different. The Prime Minister's perspective is that it should not be restricted to Delhi or Mumbai or Chennai. Uh, we should make it a people's G20. So we we are doing about... Uh, 215 meetings in 59 cities wow. of India. 59 cities of India means that it's an opportunity to transform these cities like Udaipur did this, Kumaragam is doing it, uh, Aurangabad did this, Pune did this, complete facelift of these cities. So drainage, sewage, solid waste, all this is improved in all these cities. The second is we've asked the states to do the cultural shows. So they are putting their brand entity, their cultural power, their heritage on display. And this is a great opportunity for states to use that, uh, also use their handicrafts, their handloom, uh, create a great state brand. And eventually, it's very important in a large country like India, which is bigger than 25 countries of Europe, to see that the states become great brand. And uh, they actually get into the global market. 
and that's what's happening. But we've seen a huge response from all the G20 countries in participating very actively across every single sector, from culture, tourism, to the Sherpa track, to the trade track, to the um, environment, all of them, we've had record participation here. And we're getting some very, very positive uh, uh, results of uh, G20 in every single sector. Uh, it's been a very vibrant discussion. Everybody wants results. Everybody is very positive, and that's what we are pushing for. Yeah, for somebody who championed the thought of Startup India and God's Own Country, you know how important narratives are, yeah. how important getting the yeah. story right yeah. is. Uh, is the politics and those trying to you know, portray a different perspective or portrayal, imagery of India abroad, is that affecting us, or do you believe the trade engagement, these engagements are different and what's happening there is different. And somewhere do you believe one may impact the other? So, Anand, there is a challenge. There's a challenge of geopolitics. There's a challenge of some negativity. There's a challenge of, uh, uh, you know, uh, countries into global debt. There's a challenge of, uh, uh, you know, slowdown of global growth. Uh, but we are very clear that uh, every challenge is an opportunity. We have to do it with positivity. We have to do this with optimism. And we must succeed in whatever we do, and we will succeed. Mm. Well, that, that's, the ni that's a very nice way of putting it and saying, OK, let's keep the politics aside. Let's talk about the growth story. So let me come back to that. You've also cited examples of startups which have done very well. Uh, those who are uh, getting into spaces which were never thought of before. We've quoted Dunzo, Delivery, and you know some of the others who've just done phenomenal work. Uh, is that ecosystem growing? Is that startup ecosystem in disciplines which were not thought of, future tech, while keeping in, uh, in mind the vision of life that uh, Prime Minister yeah. spoke about in October yeah. and, and this entire concept of circular economy because we've got to do it that yeah. way. We've yeah. got to grow in a sustainable yeah. way. So is that, are both getting married to each other or do you believe that what's happening in the U.S., the Silicon Valley Bank and whatever is happening in the ecosystem there is going to affect startups and the sentiment towards startup ecosystems in India. Yeah. Uh, so, Anand, a couple of points on that. One is that when we started the Startup India movement in 2016, we just had 452 startups. Today we have about 90,000 plus. We have about 110 unicorns. Uh, as we go along, we need to do a couple of things. I think first and foremost is that uh, we need a lot of more Indian funding into the yeah. startup movement. So you need a lot of more insurance uh, companies, you need a lot of more pension funds, you need a lot of Indian family businesses, all of them to have a stake in the Indian startup movement. I mean, they're top class entrepreneurs. Uh, so if you look at the story of India, for instance, we started with identity, then we went into payment, yeah. and then a number of startups actually did uh, credit, which was all paperless, cashless, and from credit they went into wealth management, stock management. So you have a company like Zeroda controlling about almost 30% of your stock market, which is cashless, paperless. And then you had a number of startups like Digit and Aco, which started doing insurance. Hmm. Uh, two minutes, you get an insurance policy because uh, it's all digital. And now you need to get into a lot of deep tech areas. So India has opened up drones, India has opened up space, yes. robotics. Uh, all these deep tech sectors are very, very critical as we go in. And uh, this would require us to push for a fund of funds uh, for hmm. a deep tech sector, to my mind. And this would also, uh, you know, uh, in a very big way, I would say that uh, uh, what we have achieved is remarkable, but the story has just begun. And therefore, a lot of more uh, initiatives from our uh, engineering institutes, which need to retailer and reorient their curriculum, to provide skills of what is required. Yeah. And that would require, you know, skills for uh, product development, skills for designing, skills for the new eras of growth. Uh, that is, that reorientation of our educational curriculum is very, very critical to me. Is it happening? NEP 2020 came through the four, but is it actually manifest? Are our, is our curriculum actually changing? We are looking at getting into the semiconductor business, chip manufacturing business. It's a huge ask, yeah. and it needs a huge number of uh, training people, personnel at various levels. We are a software-oriented country, not a hardware-oriented nation. So in those spheres, is it happening? No, so it's very important because, uh, you know, we've done very well in services because of our software. Yeah. 
But it's important for the country as a whole to realize which this book brings out is that you need to fire on all cylinders. You need manufacturing to grow at accelerated pace. You need uh, the productive efficiency to come into the agriculture sector and agriculture sector uh, actually needs to grow and all these sectors need to grow with digitization and by going green. Now, important thing is that in many of these triple IITs and some of the IITs I've seen a huge uh, transformation. I mean, if you look at this uh, MOSIP in triple IIT Bangalore, which has done an adaptation for countries as far as digital identity is concerned is remarkable breakthrough. And similarly, many other things may have been done, but I think wholesale we need a big, big transformation in the content and the curriculum of our education system, which the new education policy actually envisages. And now it's for the IIMs and triple IITs to totally alter the curriculum based on the requirement of uh, what our startups require today. Mm -hmm. One of the other domains is India has been largely driven by agriculture. Now, agriculture produce, uh, and when I say agriculture, it contains the entire gamut. So, be dairy, horticulture, everything beyond just the staples. How many startups and what's the ecosystem to develop this and to modernize this? Uh, we've talked about cold storage and cold chain, cold supply chains, one district, one product. Are there nations which are willing to partner us in that? And internally also, are there corporates who are wanting to take the business of agriculture very seriously. Uh, so two things on that. One is, uh, again, uh, uh, agriculture requires a total corporatization in terms of business and in terms of startups because uh, you need end-to-end -end of value creation from the point of production to the point of exports and you need size and scale to do that. Uh, there, therefore, uh, agriculture needs a huge, you know, you're employing about almost close to 41% of your uh, working force in agriculture sector and you need to really make it uh, work very very efficiently and therefore in recent times there's been a lot of transformation in terms of both digitization in terms of uh, digitizing land records hmm. in terms of uh, access to new technology to the farmers by the startups in terms of ensuring that the procurement system is more advanced digitally in terms of value addition of crops and in terms of better processing through cold storages and also in terms of exports. Uh, so all these uh, and much better packaging now, all these areas and one remarkable thing that has happened is that uh, there's a huge focus on millets and some remarkable new startups have come up in the field of millets who are doing really good value added products and their products actually are much better than the traditional products you get on rice and wheat. They're really beautiful, excellent uh, to taste and beautifully packaged. No, my family's moved to millets for a while, so I, I can be candid and I can own up to that. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, one of the aspects of manufacturing business in pushing a corporate environment is to also sociologically convert a nation that's largely been risk averse to somebody who's ready to take risks. So is your book telling us a mantra, how can we turn the next India or the next generation to have a bigger or a greater risk appetite? No, it's a very important point you're making because one of the thing the book brings out is that uh, actually people who've succeeded in the startup world in India are those who've actually failed. Mm. You know, they've failed uh, several times and then they've succeeded. And every Indian and every family and especially the parents must accept that failure is a very necessary ingredient for success. And, you know, when I was growing up and there was no other option but to join the government, but if I was given an opportunity, I'll do a startup now because uh, there's no better time than to do a great startup now in India because uh, the policies are all attuned to it. There's an, this is a huge opportunity for disruption in a vast range of areas. And actually, there's a massive opportunity for innovation. And uh, all these areas which are seeing huge growth because what has happened in India is that we are doing, you know, we've been able to do digital transformation as a size and scale which is unparalleled. You know, we're doing 11x digital payment of what US and Europe do, we do 4x of what China does. Uh, every Indian uh, has uh, a digital account linked to his, uh, you know, bank account. We don't use a physical bank. Uh, we are, the mobile is your virtual bank. Uh, we are throwing unprecedented amount of data. 
that data is being used for AI and ML today and therefore we are able to do innovation on population scale at very low cost. You know the cost of acquisition of an, a customer in India is very low, it's less than a dollar compared to over about a hundred dollar in Europe and America. So therefore you can scale up very rapidly population scale and the solutions you make for India then are not the solutions for just the 1.4 billion people of India but they are solutions for the next 5 billion people of the world who are moving from poverty to middle class and therefore this is a massive opportunity for India. Yeah, one of the strengths is also that we have got an interoperability as far as our digital platforms are concerned. So we do open source, open API, interoperable. Uh, this is unprecedented in the world. But uh, one, two, three aspects, you also talked about how to get to net zero in 2050. But before that in 2030, we are projected to have a workforce of 750 million people. Now that could perhaps service the whole world. But are we in a position to service those requirements because they will all need jobs. Yeah. So do you see India creating that kind of an opportunity, not just within itself but also for the world. Yeah, so I, I, I don't think India should ever look at India itself alone. Mm. We are here to capture the world. You know, with this size of population, with this level of skilled manpower, uh, with having now uh, digitized yourself, you'll have the skills to be able to, uh, you know, with a very young demographics, uh, your average age of your population, billion people less than 35, uh, average age of 29 till 2070, 30% of the workforce across the world will be from India. And that is what we should really look at. And that is what we should, it's a massive opportunity to produce the best doctors, the best nurses, uh, the best electrician, the best plumbers, the best hotel managers, all the general managers of uh, all the top hotel chains will be Indians. Because Indians will be traveling abroad and to cater to them, there'll be nobody better than them. So, what you will see in the coming years is that the Swiss hospitality industry from Lausanne will lose to all the Indian hospitality management institutes from here. They will be producing all the general managers who will be heading the Ritz-Carlton and all the top chains of the world. Let me ask you as Sherpa of India G20, what's your one single objective that at the end of these 215 odd meetings, this is what I think we should achieve as a country? So one is, uh, I think, uh, important thing is that uh, we should be, as the Prime Minister said, be ambitious, inclusive, uh, very decisive and action-oriented. So we should be able to make a difference to the world because of our G20 presidency. And that is what we are working to, towards on a vast range of areas, including uh, accelerating the pace of inclusive, resilient growth, uh, sustainable development goals, climate, digital transformation. So we should be able to make a difference to the world. Secondly, I think uh, we should be able to do this to perfection and so far uh, so good. So we should and we should continue to involve the Indian community and the Indian people and the Indian youth in all these G20s that we are doing together. And uh, it's uh, we continue to make it a great people's movement while we are doing it. Do you think, uh, and my final question here, uh, this book will help somebody who would uh, work with the perspective that I'm not going to look to somebody who's a developed nation or look to the West, but I'm going to turn back and try and help those who are looking up to us. So I'm looking at a huge global South, which is looking at India, trying to champion its needs. So this book brings out a number of unique uh, uh, examples of uh, how Indian uh, businesses have done transformational work in the last 75 years and how they made a difference to the country which is very inspirational and they've made a difference not merely to India but they've made a huge difference to the global south and therefore uh, the Indian business story is a very very inspirational story for the global south and the more we in unleash our private sector the better it will be for the both India and the rest of the world. And I have great belief, great belief that actually India's growth will be driven by the private sector in the coming years. We always need story writers and storytellers. He's one, he's good at both, isn't he? Well, I would have towards the end of the interview, you know, got up to ask you to sign it for me. But thank you very much that you've already signed this copy. Amitabh ji, always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank so you so much. My pleasure. Truly delighted to 
interact with you. Thank you.